my advice is grab a pen and take some notes. Grab a pen and take some notes. I see Ernie's just joined us and Ken. What's up, guys? So, uh, David Fraser, man, you lost some weight, dude. Looking good. Looking on, buddy. So, uh, we're going to talk about mindset. I just, and Debbie asked me to teach this class. So, last night, I went in my backyard and I had some, I had some think time. You guys, does everybody have think time? You understand what this is? This is take place where you go to meditate, where you go to think when people aren't saying mommy, mommy, daddy, daddy, or anything like that. And you just have the ability to think. So, I sat down outside and uh, I, I thought about. I said, Deb, what message do you want me to get across? And she said, I want you to teach agents the mindset of a mega agent. So I just started to write down everything that came to mind. And in the next hour, I had 38 thoughts that mega agents think. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, the class, I promise you, is a lot more fun when you interact. In other words, if you keep your, your, your screen off, your camera off, it's because you don't want to interact. So I'm going to ask for you to put all of your cameras on, and I'm going to ask you to participate. I'm going to ask you to ask questions. Because if there's no participation, then it's a lecture. On a lecture, just so you know, it's a proven fact, only 25% of what the person says you'll retain. If you interact, that goes up to 75%. So it's to your advantage to ask questions today. Does that make sense? Is everybody looking for the one three does? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. You know, you know how to get that info? Yeah. Um, you might want to mute everybody, Rich, to, uh, until they need to interact. Yeah. Until you're ready to question, just hang out. Um, and, and then here's what I'm going to tell you guys. See, most people like to go to training because they want to learn, right? I want to learn. I want to grow. And then all of a sudden, what they do is they don't take action because they tell themselves a story to justify, like, I'm brand new to real estate, so I don't want to interact. I don't want to look silly. I don't want to look bad. And I don't want to make a mistake. Guys, this isn't that class. This is the class where you ask questions, you participate. The only silly thing is the one that you question that you don't ask. Is that making sense to everybody? And especially to Elena Sanchez. I know it makes sense to her because she's, she is homebred. She is talent and she is loved by everyone. How are you, honey? So guys, let's start off. Here's some of the thoughts that I just wrote down. In order to think like a mega agent, you first have to ask yourself, why do you want to be a mega agent? So what are some of the reasons that you think people want to be mega agents? Just shout them out or type them in, whatever. Provide for a family. Provide for, absolutely, David. They want to provide by their family. What else? To be respected in the community. Respected, right? Absolutely. Legacy, things of that nature. Yep. What else? Lead a big yeah. life. They want to live a big life. Absolutely. Keep going, guys. They want to secure a great life for later on in the future. Ooh, they want to secure a great life because why settle for good while great's still available? Love that. Keep going. Expensive Be able space. to give back. So Lara, whoever wrote that, she's right behind you. I don't remember what her name is. Love that. They want to give money away to help people that can't help themselves. Leaving a legacy. A legacy. Absolutely. Now, here's some of the things that I wrote down. Everything you just said is correct. Number one, emergencies. Emergencies. So do we have enough money if we had a catastrophic event in our life with a family member? But trust me, catastrophic things do happen, and it's not the person next door. They happen to the people within your household. These things happen. We've had several people in Lake Nona office who had close calls, life and death threatening things, right? So you, do you have, if somebody had cancer, if somebody had a heart attack, if somebody had a catastrophic car accident, would you have enough money to support them to be in the hospital for six months or three months or even 30 days? Just so you know, in 2011, my mom was in the hospital for four months. She was in and out of a coma. She had brain cancer. In four months, her bill exceeded a million dollars. And that was in 2011. Do you have that kind of money on the side in case an emergency happens? The second thing I wrote down is opportunities. Opportunities, guys. So opportunities, 
I, I, I'm going to just put this out there. When do you think wealthy people create wealth? In an up market or a down market? Which do you think it is? Down. Mr. Frazier is always correct. It's in a down market. Wealthy people create wealth in down markets. Back in 2012, I bought my first real estate investment property. The market was not good. It was the end of 2011, beginning of 2012. And I started buying a string of, of investment properties while the prices were low. So now, do we have this thing called COVID in Lake Nona too? Or is it just that somewhere else? Oh, you, it's, do you think that there may be some impacts from the COVID virus that provide opportunities for those who see it as an opportunity as opposed to a person that has a mindset that says, oh my, the world is on fire, the economy's going to shit. Right, so you've got to realize, you've got to realize we are looking at opportunities and cash is king. If you don't have cash, this is a great time to have cash to swoop in and make those, create those wealth opportunities, if that makes sense yet. The third thing I wrote down is leverage. Leverage. So money allows us to trade back for time. You may want to write this down. Time is the currency of love. Time is the currency of love. How do you spell I love you to a child? T-I-M-E. That's how your kids know you love them. It's not the baseball hat. It's not the trip to Disney. You give children your time. That's their currency of love, right? The next thing I wrote down is legacy. One of you said legacy, so you nailed it. Legacy. What do you want your loved ones to remember you by? You know, uh, so Seth, uh, um, Seth Campbell taught us generational wealth and how to define that. And here's how he asked this question. He said, Rich, can you tell me the first name of any of your great grandparents? Now, everyone has eight great grandparents, eight biological great grandparents. Well, guess what? I couldn't name one of them. My guess is most of you can't either. So, and here's why. Now, if your great grandmother or great grandfather did something like invent penicillin, would we all know who they are? Would you know their name? If they, if they were Warren Buffett, would you know their name? See, in other words, our great grandparents, although we love them because we, we didn't even meet them, most of us, I've never met mine, they never did anything that we remember them by. They don't have a legacy. So the question is, do you want your great grandchildren to know you by name and tell the kids in school when they go to school 60 or 80 years from today, how proud they are of the accomplishments, things that you did? Well, now's the time to do it, right? Creating a legacy. And the fifth thing is memories, guys. Memories, oh my God. Just like Carlene Grimes was either on vacation or just came back on Facebook. I saw her with a family picture. It, she created memories, right? So was that trip good for you, Carlene, and the family? I can't hear her, so she must be muted. So she'll join him. So guys, memories. People want to have a big life. They want to create this, become mega agents so they can create memories, right? So there's things that we do. One of the things, I just built a brand new uh, a beach house in St. Augustine. And here's what I told Debbie, for the next 20 years, the most important thing for me is to create and record the memories we're about to have with our grandchildren, our children and grandchildren. So to create memories. So I want you to understand every reason why you want to become a mega agent. So everything you said was correct. Here's what I wrote down. Now I've got 38, 38 different things or thoughts or behaviors or traits that mega agents all give into. They, this, this is the way they, they present themselves. Number one, positivity. Now somebody said it, I think Lyra said, it. guys, the next time somebody asks you how you're doing, you never answer good. Why would you answer good while well, great's still available? When somebody asks you how you're doing, the answer is great, fantastic. Because if you don't buy into a great and fantastic life, don't expect the people to buy in that you're having a fantastic life. 
And the energy that you give off, the more positive you are, the more positive people will respond to you. So guys, positivity is enormous. You must have a positive outlook. What story are you telling yourself? Because if you live that story, guys, be careful of the story. Now, so let me define the word story. If you've taken bold with me, you know what this means. Story does not equal lie. Story is a truth, a perspective that you see. That's the lens in which you see something through. That's the story that you're buying into. It doesn't equal a lie. Well, if there are six stripes on a beach ball with six different colors and I put it in front of you and I ask you, what stripe do you see? You're going to choose one or two stripes. There are four or five others that are still on that beach ball. That means there are different perspectives, just like there are stripes on a beach ball. So positivity. The second is possibilities. What does possibilities mean to you? This is your turn to give feedback. So I want somebody to dial in and say, what do possibilities mean? We're talking possibilities as opposed to limitations. What does that mean to you? I've got 90 minutes, guys. I can opportunities, wait. opportunities. Opportunities, I love that. Opportunities, yeah. So possibilities, too many times I hear people saying they can't do this and they can't do that. Guys, you have got to live in a world of possibilities. So when I hear people telling me, I let them speak, I'm never rude. And then I'll say, well, what if it were possible to do 100 units in your first year? What if it were possible to do 1,000 units in your third year? What would that look like? See, we, we convince ourselves that it's not possible. That's a limitation. It's a limiting belief. Mega agents all believe, they have confidence, they believe in, and they focus their mindset on what the possibilities in life are, not what limitations. Don't let anybody de define what you're capable of doing. You decide, you get to define them. The third thing we I wrote down is surround yourselves with talent. Mega agents surround themselves with talent. So what does that mean? Somebody tell me. Surround yourself with people who are going to like help your business and help you grow. Absolutely. So Jose, for, for, for somebody who is, doesn't have the business they would want, that means finding a mentor, finding somebody that you can relate to, that you can ask questions of, somebody who you can emulate and take after. If you're, uh, if you're an accomplished mega agent and you're doing over 10, 15, 20, 40, 50, hundred million, it really, there's no limitation. The only limitation you put on your businesses by ourselves and our thinking. If you're that person, right, you need to surround yourselves with bigger thinkers. Now, one of the things I can tell you is well, I was a team leader, bold coach, general manager, OP investor, in that order. And every time I took a new role with Keller Williams, I surrounded myself with other people. Additional, it means I, doesn't mean I don't speak to Debbie Irons or, Dave, or, or Ken or Dave Frazier. I still talk to them. They're still in my group. However, I started adding new people to my group, like Diana Kokoska, John Prescott, Gary Keller. So all of a sudden, the people who were influencing the way I thought showed up in my success, in the results that I have, in my net worth, wealth, whatever you want to call it. This is all true. All mega agents surround themselves with an environment, right? And so they, they have, uh, uh, they surround themselves with talent and then they, they surround themselves with a big environment. So, you know, some of you heard me tell this story about the goldfish or the turtle, right? A goldfish or a turtle could only grow to the size of their environment, right? So if you want a big environment, if you want to be a $10 million producer, well, then you need to hang out in a brokerage that has $10 million producers. If somebody who joins Rich Carpentry Real Estate, there's only two agents and the top agent does 2 million. Who's going to show that person to do 20 million if the top agent only does two? And many people make the mistake of joining a mom and pop brokerage thinking, oh, I want to keep it small. It's more intimate. What you're really saying is you want to live a small business. You want to live a small life. You don't want your business to explode. You have the, uh, the very fortunate circumstances of being in office with 230, 225, 240 agents. You've got some really big 
mega agents in there who are willing to share, who are willing to mentor, who are willing to teach. You need to take advantage of that. The next is culture, guys, culture. So great culture leads to repeat, repeat business. Do the right thing. That's, that's part of our, our MVV BP. You've got to do the right thing. I once heard, guys, I once heard Mo Anderson in 2018 on a leadership call. I wrote this down and it's on the wall of my Citrus office. It says, culture leads to production. Production does not lead to culture. And I came from Mo Anderson, our chairman of the board. Guys, when you're in great culture, people will want to find you to do business with you. Other agents will find you to do um, referrals, things of that nature. Which brings me to the next one. Guys, this is a really big problem. Do we have a lot of caddy chatties out there like me? You like to talk? So this is one of the first things I had to learn in being a coach. You may want to write this down. Listen with the intent to understand not with the intent to respond. I'll say it again. Listen with the intent to understand, not with the intent to respond. So I'm from New York, I'm fast speaking, and people say something and my natural behavior is to respond. Well, who, who is that for? Is that for them or for me? Who does that make feel better? Yeah, that's, a, that's all about me. So the question I had to ask myself is when am I willing to make life about other people? That's a pretty deep question to ask yourself, right? Because when you, when you listen at a deep level to understand, you allow other people to talk. Does that make sense? So always don't be so quick to respond when people speak to you. Make sure you understand what they're saying. So you may want to talk back and say, say David, if I heard you correctly, you said, Blah, blah, blah. Because how many times do we misunderstand what a person says? Does that happen a lot to everybody? Me too. See, what I've learned as a coach, though, is I ask questions, right? I want to seek first to understand. I don't jump to conclusions. I ask questions to gain clarity. The next is to uh, mega agents, all are servant leaders, guys. They come from contribution. They want to help people. You know, one of the lessons I've learned <clears throat> through Keller Williams, I've learned so many lessons. The 12 years I've been with Keller Williams, I learned more than the 48 years prior to Keller Williams. I just turned six. I'll actually be 61 soon. So I I've learned so much in just 12 years. It's like I felt like it was jam-packed into 12 years, right? So one of the things that I've, I've learned is that um, success is a, is a wonderful thing. And I realized that, um, being the team leader there for a little more than six years, uh, developing some great leaders um, and, and pouring into other people. So the office grew from 42 agents to 228 the day I left over six years. And um, that was all about me, guys. And that was wrong. That was wrong. And so, but it, it, not that success is wrong. It wasn't right for me. And I felt this hole in my stomach that something was missing, there was a void. There had to be something after success and I couldn't identify it. And I had a conversation with Diana Kokoska and she says, Richard, there's nothing wrong with what you're feeling. What you're feeling is what you don't understand what comes after it. I said, well, please enlighten me, explain to me what that, what, what's missing. I'm missing something from my life. And she just phrased it up by telling me this, successful people climb ladders people hold them for others to climb. She said, what you're looking for isn't success, success it's significance. So, so guys, after there's more to life than success because success is about what we do. Significance is about the people's lives you influence. It's no longer about us, right? So that's something mega agents spend time thinking about. The next thing I wrote down is mega agents are disciplined. Your discipline. Guys, you have got to master your time blocking. You do not have the leisure. Mega agents don't, they don't go to the copy machine and spend 20 minutes on a conversation that Tampa Bay beat the Yankees. They don't go out, that's done later at night. They're disciplined. 
They account for every minute on their calendar. They come in at 8.30, they script and role play 15 minutes, they get their database ready from 8.45 to 9 o'clock, from 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock, they make phone calls. From 11 o'clock to 11.30, they update their database. From 11.30 to 12 o'clock, they, they go on their first appointment, 12 o'clock is the first listing. They, everything is regimented, guys, right? Everything is, but discipline, discipline. The next thing I wrote down is uh, mega agents first have to master yourselves before you master anything else. The first thing you have to master is yourself. Now this is called the airplane rule. So when the air, when the air pressure comes down and the air, the oxygen comes down, who must you put the mask on first? Live question. Yourself. Why yourself? That's the nice of you. Yeah, if you don't have oxygen and you black out because of pressurization, how can you help the kids? How can you help your loved ones? Guys, you have got to master yourself. You have to understand yourself. Mega agents don't fly by the seat of their pants. Everything has been calculated. They understand how to master. They understand discipline, right? The next thing uh, mega agents do is they have abundance thinking versus scarcity. Abundance. As the team leader, one of the first questions I used to ask when I met with a person was, so how much money do you want to make in your first year at Keller Williams? Now, whether it was a brand new agent to real estate or it was new, an agent from Coldwell Banker, Century 21 Exit, Remax, whatever, and they were joining Keller Williams, I'd ask that question, and what do you think the most popular number was? Shout out. $100,000. That Six was, figures. It was less than 100. It was less than that. 50,000. There you go. That's the number. Now, I did have some people think, say, 100,000. Majority, more than half would say 50,000. Now, I'm saying, guys, and don't take this the wrong way. How does one live a big life on $50,000? If you believe you could live a, a big life on $50,000, it's because you've never made 50000 a big life means making a million dollars your first year. And the only thing that's stopping you from making a million dollars this year is you. The moment you believe in you and the moment you believe and hang out with other people that make a million dollars a year, you have several of them in your office right now. Anybody who's doing over $35 million a year is making more than a million dollars a year in gross commission income. If you want to learn how to be a millionaire, then you need to hang out and think like millionaires. Remember this, the only difference between successful people or wealthy people and average people is the way you process information, right? Wealthy people talk about possibilities. Poor people talk about limitations. Wealthy people want to talk about revenue. Poor people want to talk about expenses. Wealthy people want to talk about their future. Poor people want to talk about their past. Now, guys, you've got to get this right. The way you process information needs to change right here and right now. If you want to become a mega agent, you want to be a multimillionaire, you can do all of those things and more. Because your father wasn't a millionaire doesn't mean anything. The most amount of money my father made in one year was $35,000, 1979. He worked in the post office in the Bronx. My parents never owned a house. They never owned a condo. My father didn't buy his first car until he was over 40 years old. Couldn't afford one. Now, doesn't mean I don't love my dad. I don't want to think like my dad because thinking like my dad will lead to a life like my dad. I have to think totally different. It doesn't mean I don't love him. Does everybody understand that difference? Okay, next. Mega agents are driven by a big why. You saying you want to close 100 units or 1,000 units or 10,000 units a year is irrelevant unless I understand why. The people that do it have a big enough why, right, that's driving them. It's their passion is the fuel that achieves the success. So in other words, when a person says, I have a child, who has a medical condition that requires 
$10,000 a month for medication, which isn't covered by my health insurance, has a really big why, why they need to make $250,000 a year minimum. Because 120,000 of it's gonna to go to pay the bills, medical bills. Now, do you think as a parent, that parent is not gonna provide the, the money, the whatever the success it takes to get that medication for that child? I guarantee you the person does, that's their big why. So if you go to work every day not knowing what your big why, if it's not on a sign on the wall reminding you what your big why is, you're cheating yourself out and you're cheating your family. Your big why should be known to everybody. What's your why? My why is I have four kids, I wanna buy 20 houses, give each one five. Right now I have eight houses and seven market centers. My big why is five houses for every kid. I have four. And now I have three grandkids. Maybe we want to up that and put two to each grandchild. Maybe I need to change it to 26. Does that make sense? That fuel, that's my fuel. That's my gasoline. That's my passion. Is my why drives me to get out of my comfort zone. Next, mega agents follow systems and models. They don't wing it. Winging it is a natural behavior that comes to us. We want to wing things. You must follow a system and a model. So I'm going to name a restaurant. I'm not going to say if it's good or bad. You decide. I want you, I think everybody knows the place they've been there. It's called McDonald's. If you've been there, raise your hand. If, if you haven't, you're probably not paying attention. Okay, so McDonald's. So now here's the funny thing. Whether you go into McDonald's in, in, in Lake Nona on Narcusi Road, or you go in New York City on Times Square, or if I go to McDonald's in Beijing, China, the French fries are exactly the same. They taste the same. I don't care where you go. Now, I want you to think about it. What's the average age of a person working in McDonald's making French fries? 18. How can 18-year-olds from different parts of the country or different parts of the world have the same product, taste exactly the same, unless there was systems and models? Step one, they take the french fry out of the freezer. Step two, they let it thaw. Step three, they put it in the oil so for a certain amount of time at a certain degree. Step five, they put salt on. Step six, they hand it to the customer. Systems and models. Mega agents follow systems and models. When a person tells a mega agent this objection, the agent gives them this response. When they say that, they give a different response. Too many times you're going on appointments and people are giving you objections and you don't know how, how to respond to it. You don't know how to handle it. You're winging it. What if there was a book that you can just read and they say, they say this, you say that. They say that, you say this. Well, it exists. There it is. Thank you, David. It exists. So why aren't we reading those books? And why aren't we using those dialogues, those scripts, right? Next, mega agents have short-term and long-term goals. Short-term, in other words, short-term. What is your goal? How many appointments do you plan to book today? Short term. How many do you plan to book this week? Short term. How many plan to book this month? Short term. What do I want to make in five years? Long term. What are your goals for today? How many hours are you going to lead generate? How many conversations are you going to have? How many connections are you going to make? How many appointments are you going to book? See, I've got all of these questions. And when you have the answers, you're a mega agent. If you don't ask yourself these questions, it doesn't mean you're crazy when you talk to yourself. Guys, you need to sit down and self-reflect. It's called think time. You can do it in your bed. You can do it in a chair in the bedroom. You can do it in your patio in your garden. I had reflected for about an hour and a half last night and wrote all these notes in 90 minutes on my patio looking over my garden. I didn't have any interruptions. I just sat down, right? Next. <clears throat> Mega agents are willing to pay the price for success. Success has a price tag. It does not mean long hours. Let me say it again. Do not ever confuse success with long hours. Wrong. 
wrong mindset. You need to work, you need to work smarter, not harder. So, which brings me to my next point. The next thing I wrote down, mega agents understand that time and effort are not deciding factors for success. It's mindset and leverage. I'll say it again. Mega agents understand that time and effort are not deciding factors for success. It's mindset and leverage. And until you get your mindset right, you're chasing something that's somebody else. In other words, you're not living up to your potential. It's not the amount of hours. It has nothing to do with that. It's not how hard you work or the amount of effort. You say, I, I ask people, you know, when I'm teaching bold, did you make your hundred contacts this week? They say, yeah, how many appointments did you set? They say none. Well, how many do you have from step one? We're in step six. They say, I haven't set an appointment yet. I've made 700, had 700 conversations. And I would ask this question because the answer is always in the question. It's never in the answer. What was your goal by making a phone call? And most people would say, I wanted to just hit my 100 contacts so I didn't, so I didn't get a foul. Guys, the goal of making the phone call was to set an appointment. It's not to avoid fouls and bold. It's not to make your team leader or your spouse happy. The, 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 the whole goal is to set an appointment. Now, when you pick up the phone and every phone call you make, you've got to say to yourself, my goal before I make this call is to set an appointment. Regardless what the person says to you, your goal on the next phone call has not changed. It's the same outcome. Next. Mega agents are willing to do what makes them feel uncomfortable or unnatural. Guys, until you feel comfortable feeling uncomfortable, you're not going to be a mega agent. If you make a list in life, all the things that make you feel uncomfortable and then all, in real estate, and then all the things that make you comfortable, the list, the side that makes you feel uncomfortable will make you wealthy. You continue to do the items and tasks that make you feel comfortable, you're just average. Mega agents all do what makes them feel uncomfortable. That means stop by the house, they're driving by, they're going to dinner, they see it, you know, it says for sale by owner, they stop with the kids in the car and they knock on the door. Do you understand the behavior and the thought process of a mega agent? They don't think like most people. That's why not everybody's a mega agent because everybody wants to feel comfortable. They say, well, I'm just, you know, I'm only in real estate, you know, six months. I, I just don't feel comfortable calling an expired listing. I don't feel comfortable knocking on a for sale by owner. I'm not comfortable. I'm in McDonald's and the person in front of me is talking about listing their house. I don't know them. I mean, if they, if they, if they were to ask me, I would tell them to mind their business. See, guys, you haven't made real estate about the other person. And as a coach, I would say, until you make real estate about other people instead of yourself, you're on an ego trip. Get off the ego trip. Real estate is not about us as real estate agents. Real estate has got to be about the benefit. How can you help other people? And then, then the whole world will change towards your perception. <clears throat> Next, hire a coach. Hire a coach. Guys, I have two MAPS coaches. Two MAPS coaches. You need to hire a coach. Here's why. You're indicatively not strong enough to discipline yourself or hold yourself accountable. Now, when you go to a gym, if you take this seriously, you hire what? A trainer. What is a trainer? A coach. If you take go on a diet and you take it seriously, what do you hire? A dietitian. What's that? A coach. It's not a dirty word. Because coaches, remember this, the difference between a coach and a mentor is vast. A mentor will discuss strategies with you. Because you know what to do, does that guarantee it's going to work? A coach will actually get you to take the actions that are required to, to implement that strategy. The coach is going to ask you, okay, so, so Debbie, why didn't you make three hours of phone calls today? What held you back? Okay, why, 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 was, why does rejection hurt? Why, and they're going to keep saying why, why until they get to the core of it. 
they're going to keep peeling back that onion. So once you understand yourself, then you will learn to master yourself and then you'll get out of your own way. The problem is nobody's peeling back your onion. Why? Most of you don't have coaches. Some of you do. Debbie does. David does. There's a bunch of you that have coaches. Kevin does. You'll, every person, Lyra has one. Every person, if there's anybody, I can only see 25 people on my screen, so I apologize. Every single person needs a coach. There's no such thing as being a mega agent if you don't have a coach. You need a coach. Next. You need to take a consultative approach as opposed to a sales approach. And I demonstrated this earlier with Lyra when I said, or I think it was Lyra, about her, or could have been another phone call, just brain fart time. <laughs> so what if I said to Lyra, hold up your hand, Lyra, show me your watch. You don't have one. Okay. So guys, if I saw one of you that had a watch on and you're walking by in a kiosk in a mall and I said, Debbie, uh, I said to them, ma'am, can you, you know, can you come over here? I've got something that's going to clean that, that, that your jewelry, that tennis bracelet, that watch, that ring, that's a sales pitch. Do you think people want to be sold? No. What do you do? You just keep walking. You see the purple item on the desk. They're trying to sell you that same purple thing for 20 years. Right? So you just want to walk by them. You need to take a consultative approach. You need to ask people, people, why is it important for you to sell your house? Why is it important for you to buy your first investment property? What does everybody understand the difference between consultative and sales? Because salespeople smell, they smell from commission breath and everybody knows you have commission breath because the only thing you're interested in is the commission. When you're a, when you're a consultant, all of a sudden, the commission is irrelevant. Oh, trust me, they show up, but that's not why you're doing what you're doing. You're helping people because you truly want to help the person. You're putting their needs before your commission. You've now graduated. You're a consultant. Next, mega agents are always, they're always looking for ways to make progress. They always take a step forward. They never go backwards. Mega agents, now remember this, guys. You might have saw this movie, Run, Forrest, Run. Forrest Gump. Now, he ran from the East Coast to West Coast and back, back and forth, West Coast to East Coast, whichever. Now, all you have to do is just take one step at a time. I don't care if you take baby steps or big steps. You need to take steps in the right direction. The problem is this. Most people can't decide which direction to go. So. If you're, not, if you're confused about what direction life is taking you, what do people do? They stand still. They stand still. Choose a direction. It doesn't matter what direction you choose. Gary Keller says this all the time. Choose a direction. Here's the greatest thing of all. If you don't like what the scenery looks like, change your direction. Mega agents always choose a direction and it's always moving forwards. And that's why Gary always ends every email with one word. Who knows what that word is? What's the one word he ends every email with? Onward. 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 Guys, he never takes a step backwards. He's always moving forward, even if it's baby steps. Next, mega agents all have standards with consequences. Standards with consequences. So what are your standards? Because in the absence of standards, you just have goals, right? The difference between a goal and a standard is the consequence which you implement if it isn't here. So if you're running a team and your standard is every buyer's agent is going to close two units a month, what happens when they close one? Are you having that conversation for transition off the team? Or are you going to pat them on the back and say, we'll have a better month next, next month? Guys, there's got to be standards. See, that's where the discipline comes in. Mega agents are disciplined to have those conversations. And they don't get confused between a conversation and a confrontation. Those are two different things. The conversations they have are called tough love. They're going to love you with a two by four. We've all had this done to us by our parents. You ran in the street, your father showed you some tough love. I'm sure of it. Your mom whooped you. That doesn't make her a bad mom. That means she loved you. Guys, you got to be disciplined in this area. The next Mega agents realize their biggest competitor is their potential and not the agent to your left or your right. 
your biggest competition, your biggest competitor is your potential. Are you living up to your potential? Guys, you have got to, that's the only thing. Nobody said, if you don't know who Bob Lucido is, he closes 2,200 units a year. If you don't know who Lance Loken is, he closes 2,500 units a year. Nobody said you have to be Lance Loken to close 2,500. But what you should be striving to be is the very best version of Ken Meyer, the very best version of Ernie, the very best version of Lyra. Your potential is something you strive to chase. You strive to be. And too many of us don't see our own potential because they, they say, well, I, I couldn't do 2,500 units. I, I, I wouldn't want to sell 100 units because that'll take too much time. Do you know the more units you sell, the less time you spend in real estate? And remember, what is the currency of love? Time. To spend time. Now, how good would it be to make over a million dollars a year net in your pocket and you only work five to 10 hours a week? So you can spend the rest of the time with the people that matter most. See, that's a life worth living and a business worth owning. That's what you get when you're a mega agent. And, and never confuse, guys, never confuse. Did I say it was going to be easy? No. Are there going to be challenges yet? Absolutely. Just never confuse the word stumbling block with starting block. Don't make your challenges be a stumbling block. Look at your challenges as a starting block. Something that you have to overcome. Because life is going to throw us challenges. Just don't approach them as stumbling blocks. These should inspire you to a higher level. Next, mega agents understand that R&D does not mean research and development. It means rip off and duplicate. Rip off and duplicate. You don't have to recreate the wheel. We have systems and models by agents like Lance Loken, like by, by Bob, Bob Lucido, the biggest agents in the world, by Ben Kenny. They all close over 2,000 units a year. They have systems and models. You have them available to you for free. So why are you looking to create your own? There's only one reason, and it goes back to ego. It always goes back to ego, because we think we can do it better than everybody else. Guys, there's been people that did it before us. They're bigger, smarter, and faster. Let's just use their systems and models and implement it and emulate them and just watch how you grow. Next, mega agents are focused on their big dreams. They are not focused on their big problems. Once again, dreams are in the future, problems are in the past. When you drive your car, you've got to look through the big windshield, not the small rear view mirror. Don't go through life looking in the rear view mirror. You need to go through life, driving through life, this thing we call life, going through this big windshield, looking into the future, not into the past. Next, mega agents play to win. They don't play not to lose. Now, there's a big difference here. If you're football fans, I know Frazier's a big football fan. When New England, who I can't stand, was playing Atlanta, and they were down 28 to nothing at halftime, right? Atlanta was just dominating both sides of the football. They came out in the second half and they changed their strategy. They played more conservative. They stopped passing. They were trying to run the clock out. See, they came out at the front of the game with a strategy. They want to win the Super Bowl. And they came out in the third quarter of they didn't want to lose the Super Bowl. Well, what was the end result? What did Tom Brady do? Did he annihilate them, pick them apart in a second? Here's why. Tom Brady was playing to win the whole game. He didn't get his act together in the first half, but he never changed his strategy. He was playing to win in the second half. Atlanta changed their strategy. They went from playing to win to playing not to lose. Evidently, they lost. Guys, go through life playing to win every day. Don't ever take the strategy of not to lose. Next. Understand your value proposition and be able to articulate it. Mega agents understand what they offer and they can articulate it. I'll give you a perfect example. I heard um, Gene Rivers say this once. 
<clears throat> many years ago when I was getting certified to teach Recruit Select, which is the class before career visioning. So I, got, I became a certified instructor and I used to teach team building in the Lake Nona office six times a year on how to build a team. And Gene Rivers said something that stood with me. Um, so when you're building a team, understand what your value proposition is. So a lot of times a buyer's agent comes on a team and the very first question they ask is, what's the commission split? And he said, if the person answers the question, then that person doesn't want to build a team. Because the person who asked the question needs guidance. And the answer should sound something like this. So typically a person applying to be on a, on a buyer's agent on a team typically has done fewer than 10 transactions, mostly like five or six. So Debbie, if the average commission is about $8,000, $7,000, does that sound about right? So if you did five or four transactions, they've made 30 or $40,000 as a solo agent, right? And they're worried that the team structure in Keller Williams we, we promote is a 50-50 split between you and the Rainmaker. Well, that's not their value proposition. The value proposition is they're going to mentor you. They're going to show you strategies. They're going to provide you a transaction to close. They're going to provide you an administrative assistant. They're going to provide you accountability and they're going to provide you with leads. So would you rather make $30,000 or $40,000 by yourself or would you rather make $75,000 on a team? See, now I've articulated a value proposition for a rainmaker. And if the person says, well, I don't want you to get half my commission, that person's not a fit to be on a team. Their mindset is wrong and that's what's holding them back from growth, right? It's not about the commission. It's no different than a person saying, would you take 5%? Hopefully you're able to hand that objection hand. Right? So is, is, is it about the commission split or is it about how much money you take home, Mr. And Mrs. Seller? If I can show you how to take home more money, does it matter what the commission split is? What my commission is? Does everybody understand that? Okay. Next one up. Mega agents are willing to invest in themselves and others. They're willing to invest in themselves and others. Now that could mean time, it can mean training, it can mean classes, it can mean bold, it can mean mega camp, it can mean family reunion. You need to be learning based. You need to be learning based. Next, I wrote down mega agents, either they're great developers of people or they hire someone to develop their people. Mega agents are either great developers of people or they hire someone to develop. If you can't develop a person, when a person joins your team, you're, you're, you're here in life. Do you think their goal in 20 years is to be at the same level or do they want to be higher? We've got to pour into people and develop them. No different than leadership, right? So we've got to develop. So, so the mindset of a mega agent is I have to have something to offer to develop people. And if I can't do it, I need to hire somebody to do that. Next. Mega agents know their numbers all the time. Now, a lot of you shy away from this. It's a mistake, it's a big mistake, and here's why. You know your numbers. If we, can we, do we have permission to have an honest conversation right now? Okay, so most of you shaking your head yes, some of us are gonna leave the conversation, they don't wanna know. Here's the truth, you know your numbers, you know your social security, you know your waistline, you know your weight. You know your numbers. So you know exactly how many closings you took last month. You know how much money you made last year. When a person says, I don't know, that's the story they create inside their own mind so they don't have to reveal because they're embarrassed about what they made last year. Guys, the number doesn't make a difference. What does make a difference is the fact that you take ownership of the number. You do know what that number is. And guys, until you are aware of what that number is, you can't move forward. You're stuck in perpetuity. If you want to move forward, you need to put it out there. So if you made 40,000 last year or 20,000 last year or 10,000 or 100, whatever the number is, does not matter. People are not here to mock you. Your leadership team over there is there to help you. 
but don't dare look one of your, your Debbie in the face or, or Lyra, any on the leadership team and say, you don't know how many listings you took last month or last year. You don't know how many closings. I don't track that. Those are all words of defeated people who've already lost. Now, the last time I know, everybody who got in the ring with Mike Tyson believed they can beat him. Now, some might have walked out with one less year. However, they all believed they were going to win the fight. You don't get in the ring unless you think you're going to win. Question is, how are you getting into the arena? If you don't know your numbers, you're walking in defeated. You don't have a shot. You're not going to take that listing. You're not going to get that buyer. You had better be confident and know your numbers, guys. Mega agents know their numbers. Leadership, that means you need to know your numbers. That means how many agent count is, what the profitability was, GCI of the office, all of that stuff, profit share. Know your numbers. Next, mega agents know that goal is not perfection. The goal is not perfection. The goal is results. It's not about you being perfect. Guys, perfection is overrated. Perfection is what leads to procrastination. Perfection is a disease and as deadly as cancer. Perfection will kill your business. Perfection will send you to unemployment. It's not about looking good. It's not about being right. It's about getting the job done. The goal is results, your achievements. So don't get confused on, you know what? I, I was gonna go door knock and I'm just not ready. Let's just call BS, BS. And we all know what that stands for, bologna sandwich, right? So let's just call it out there, guys. Don't procrastinate. So what if you make a mistake? Your leadership team is here to support you. Next, <clears throat> mega agents aim for what's possible, not what's easy. Mega agents aim for what's possible, not what's easy. If you're doing what comes easy to you, there's no challenge. There's no achievement. You sure feel good about it, but you haven't achieved anything. Now do something you've never done before. Accomplish something you've never done before. Now we're talking because now you're on a pedestal. You've done something that's worthy. Every time we do something for the first time, it feels uncomfortable. If you've had children before, grandkids, nieces and nephews, they've rode their bike for the first time. At some point, you had to let go of the seat. And inevitably, every one of those kids fell. Every single one. They got brushed up, scraped up, they cried. You picked them up, you held them in your arms, you comforted them, and you told them to get back on the seat. They didn't want to go. You knew it was in their best interest. So when you stumble, when you're door knocking and you get twisted on your words and you don't know how to handle an objection, right? Your coach, your team leader, your leadership group are gonna be there to hug you and then send you back out and do it again. Guys, you got, you've got to do the things that make you feel uncomfortable. You don't give up. Winners don't quit and quitters don't win. Go out and do what you were destined to do. Next. Top agents, mega agents never settle. They never settle. In fact, Gary Keller, I have a coffee mug from Gary Keller that says, never settle. I'm never going to sell my family short. You notice I didn't say me. I'm never going to sell my family short by settling on anything. On that kind of wealth building, investing, leadership, opportunities. That means I have to be uncomfortable. <coughs> Growth happens when you're uncomfortable. You don't grow when you do something you're comfortable doing. You grow when you do things that make you feel uncomfortable. Next, mega agents talk about how they build their future, not dwell in the past. Mega agents talk about how they build their future. They don't look in the past. They reflect upon their past for learning opportunities to make change in the future, yes. They don't live in the past. You ever hear a poor person? All they do is talk about bills. Oh my God, I got a flat tire. I can't believe my car broke down. The battery went. It cost me $147. That's poor person language. That's victim language. I don't believe you'll ever hear Warren Buffett complain about the price of the battery. Next. 
Mega agents focus on long-term gratification versus short-term gratification. Now that's different than I said goals before. Mega agents have short-term goals and long goals. Short-term, long-term gratification means they're building a future. They want repeat business, long-term gratification. I sell David Frazier a house today. I want to sell his, I want to send his children a house. I want to sell his grandchildren a house. So I give the best customer service possible because I want the long-term. Short-term gratification is I've got to just make a mortgage payment. My bill is due on Monday. Matter of fact, it was due 10 days ago. I'm late. So I got to do whatever I got to do to sell a lane or a house right now so I can pay the bill. They forfeit. They, they don't focus on short-term gratification. It's not about how much money they make this week. It's about building a pipeline so they have a whole future, a business that they can sell. Next, mega agents understand tool versus task. Tool versus task. They see real estate as a tool or a platform to achieving their big why, they don't see real estate as a task. So everything in life, when I talk to my team leaders in my market centers, I say, do you see this as a tool or a task? When I'm launching Bold, I speak to the team leaders and I say, do you see Bold as a tool or a task? It's either a tool to build up the profitability of your office or it's just another thing for you to do. So my question is, do you see lead generation as a tool to making you millionaires? Or do you see it a task that's just on your calendar? Guys, I've just given you 38 different thoughts of how mega agents think. I'm hoping, I'm hoping just a few will change the direction of your careers and point you to where you need to be. And I don't care if you just got your license yesterday and just signed up with the office. I don't care if you're not even licensed yet. Until you think like mega agents think, you won't have the results that mega agents have. So I just wanna open this up to some q and A. I'm hoping you took some notes and then we'll go through some ahas. What questions does anybody have or explanations that um, they want me to drill down to? Um, I see some of the comments I haven't been reading because I've been reading what I've written down, I love this. Perfection leads to procrastination. Absolutely, Debbie. We have from Marina. She said, I love this. Ernie, abundance thinking, not scarcity. Absolutely. Uh, Karina said 100,000. That was probably the second number most people said. The first was 50,000. Uh, be surrounded by people with similar mindsets that are constantly growing. You know, and I don't know, and I absolutely agree. I don't know who said this, but they said, if you take your five closest friends and add up their net worth, whatever their average is, is how much you're worth. So if you want to have a higher net worth, choose, choose a new fab five, right? Choose a new fab five. Doesn't mean you throw away your old ones. You just, the people who are closest with you are the ones who are going to plant seeds and influence the way you think. So when, I, when both coaches have training and Gary Keller is one of the instructors, how excited do you think I get that I get to sit in a small room with 20, 30, 40 people with Gary Keller and Mastermind? That was a live question, guys. Does everybody understand? Yeah, th these are just wonderful. So talk to me about what questions that everybody has. This is your opportunity to get clarity on something I might have said. Guys, it's your time. Hi. Yeah, Hi, I, I joined late after half an hour, but I, cool. I, wrote, I wrote some notes. Uh, I'm new to the office and I got a mentor uh, to help me out. Now I heard you saying mentor is different than the consultant or coach. Coach. Yeah. coach. So what should I do? You should do both. So, so the mentor is going to discuss strategies of what they've done to experience success selling real estate, listing real estate. So they're going to give you strategies. A coach's okay. job is not, to, their job is not to give you a strategy. Their job is implementing the strategy. Because let's say uh, if Bob Lucido was here right now, he's got a team of people that make phone calls to expired listings. Right. So he's got he probably 
I'm going to say he takes somewhere around 50 listings a month, 60 listings a month, maybe a little bit more, 50 or 60 listings a month. He probably gets about 10 or 15 listings a month from expired listings. So if I told you to call expired listings, that's a strategy. Does that mean you're going to do it? Or even if you do it, are you going to be successful at it? Do you know what to say? And the answer is probably not. A coach is going to help you implement the strategy. So there's a difference between the two. A coach's job is accountability. They make sure you, you do exactly what you say you're going to do. So David, may I share what we used to do to what you asked me to hold you accountable to when I was team leader like eight years ago with the checks? Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. That's fine. I always ask for permission. So when I was a team leader, so David, we'd sit down and we'd have a consultation every month. And I said, David, I want to hold you. He asked me to hold him accountable. He asked me. So I said, great, take out your checkbook. He said, why? I said, write three checks. David, correct me if I go wrong or if I exaggerate, because I'm not, this is the truth. So I said, there's got to be a check for $25, $50, and $100. So he writes them out. So he says, who do I make them payable? To you? I said, no. Maritza Ramos. At the time, she was Lira. She was the MCA. She said, what are these checks for? I said, the first time you don't report your numbers or you don't do what you say you're going to do, Maritza's going to cash the check and go out to eat. Yes? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And hope we cashed the 25, you cashed the 50. You can't. Now, occasionally, David didn't submit his numbers to me at the end of the day. Maybe he lead generated. He forgot to send them to me. That wasn't the deal. The deal was you do your lead gen, you send me your numbers by text by a certain time. If you don't, Maritza cashes the check. Now, Maritza, bless her heart, felt so guilty. She's cashing checks. She feels guilty. I says, now you got to make it hurt. You got to take a picture, take another agent to lunch, take a picture, and say, thank you, Dave. <clears throat> now, guys, after you cash a couple of checks, believe it or not, David said, I'm not, you're not cashing anymore. Not that he stopped the accountability. He did what he was supposed to do. Well, the 25 and the 50 didn't hurt, Rich. That, you know, I don't care. Those aren't, those aren't big. The $100 ones, my, you know, my wife's going, why the hell are you getting another girl some you know, $100 bill? So. <laughs> Do you understand accountability now? Eventually, yeah, yeah. Because after the 100, then the checks were 200, 500, 1,000. They just kept growing. Eventually, you're going to stop. You're going to do. We're gonna, you're going to condition yourself to do the behavior that you want to do to become successful. So will it though? Yes, yes, okay. Understand. So I'm hoping that helps you. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So who else has questions or anything you want to discuss? So uh, let me understand. To have a coach, I have to be with a team or I'll have a coach one on one. Well you can be you can be on a team, but you, you don't. Uh, you can just you can get do you have productivity coaching in the office, Debbie? Uh, she's in a different office. She's not in Lake Nona. Okay. I'm so, in Waterford. What, so which office are you in? Waterford. Oh, Waterford. Yeah, I would speak to your team leader, Brandon, and uh, just find out what they have available there. I don't know what programs are available. So, okay. Thank great you. question. Debbie, you wanted to say something or ask a question. Yeah, I wanted to talk about, um, you mentioned possibility. This was actually like in your top ones and you talked about possibility and I think that was huge for, for me and what changed my mindset and of course why I'm still here with Keller Williams and so passionately believe in the models and the systems and the beliefs because I tell the story of being a little girl on the beach and looking up at people on the, in their beach condos on the beach and like, what would it be like? You know, the, can you imagine what does that take? And I think Keller Williams and being a part of Keller Williams and surrounding yourself, as you mentioned, around the really big thinkers changes your mindset of, oh my gosh, there is that possibility. That is something I could do of something I couldn't even imagine, you know, buying one property, nonetheless, you know, five or six over there. So I want to encourage everybody. Um, we have our vision uh, board scheduling party. We have a vision board party on Thursday. Like that is the time to surround yourself by your big thinkers and really think big of the possibilities. Like, I see a lot of people or I hear a lot of people thinking small and not thinking big. And, and I encourage everybody to attend that because 
that can really change your mindset of those possibilities. And people are worried about putting like those beautiful shoes and cars and like, this is what it's about. It's about taking all those possibilities and sticking them on this board and imagining those possibilities because Keller Williams, you've got all of these people that are, are not only talking about it, they're doing it. So the possibilities are incredible to kind of open your mind and it re-motivates you and re-excites you to get back in the grind. So I just want to encourage everybody to attend. I love that. You know, possibility thinking is endless, guys. It's, 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 it's inspiring. Um, you know, when you start thinking from possibilities as opposed to limitation thinking, your whole perspective on life will change. You'll start to see that the cup is 10% full. You won't tell me it's 90% empty. You'll start to see the good in everything. Remember this, every catastrophic event in the history of the world had something good come out of it. The worst thing I've ever lived my life, I'm six, I'll be 61 years old. The worst thing I've ever witnessed in my life was 9-11. Now, most people would say that's the most horrific day in their life. And I remind people when they bring it up that the best thing that ever happened about 9-11 was 9-12. Because the day after, there weren't white Americans or African Americans or Asian Americans. There weren't Republicans, Democrats, Independents, or, or conservatives. There were only Americans. The whole country came together. Guys, when the real estate market went down in 2006 and fell apart, I can't tell you how many millionaires were created. I was one of them. I took advantage. It took me six years. 2012, I started buying uh, investment real estate. And then I started tracking my net worth in 2013 in the Dave Ramsey class. And I learned about wealth building. I became passionate about it. I taught ALCs with David and Debbie were on those ALCs when we spoke about wealth building every month as a leadership group. It changed my life because I came from possibilities. What if something were possible that yesterday I thought wasn't possible? You need to break down those barriers. You need to change the story that you tell yourself. Remember, story doesn't mean it's a lie. It's just a perspective. Change your perspective and say, well, what if it were possible? What if it were easy to sell a thousand houses? Who would I follow? What actions would I take? What would their day look like? Does that make sense? And it all comes possible. One of the best possibility thinking, um, I saw a guy before I was with Keller, when I owned my own brokerage before Keller Williams, I was in the process of joining Keller Williams. This was in some time in the beginning of 2008. I saw Mike Brody, who is a very wealthy person, a big, really big person in Keller Williams. He taught a wealth building seminar in, um, in Orlando and I was a guest. And there's probably a hundred agents there. Um, and I was in there and somebody asked the question, it was, it was a great question. So he, he says to Mike, Mike was going through a PowerPoint slide and talking about profit share debt. And he said, my first year in Keller Williams, guess how much I made in profit share? He said, zero. He said, my second year in Keller Williams, how much do you think I made in profit share? He showed a PowerPoint slide that said a thousand dollars. He said, now remember, he joined in 1993. This was 2008, so 15 years. He said, let's fast forward. How much do you think I made in 2007, which was the year before I saw this class in profit share? And the answer was 500,000. So he says, cumulatively in my life over the 15 years in Keller Williams, up to that point, he made $2 million. That was in 2008. He's now over 6 million in profit share. So he taught me about wealth building. He taught me about possibilities. The question that actually changed my life, I don't know who he is to give credit to, was an agent in the audience stood up and said, Mike, what's your definition of wealthy? That definition changed my life. Because the answer he gave, I don't remember it verbatim, but I'll do my very best. He said, being able to do whatever I want, whenever I want, with whomever I choose. He said, it's not a state of money, it's a mindset. Being wealthy is a mindset. Wealthy people think differently than poor people. Wealthy people think differently than average people. They're not smarter. They just process information. They live in a world of possibilities. And Mike said, so he asked, these, he asked the whole audience, there's a general question. He said, so 
would you consider yourself wealthy? Well, at, the point, at, at that point in my life, I had bills to pay, right? I couldn't stop working. I couldn't do whatever I want, whenever I want, or with whomever I chose. So the answer was no. So he said, the question was, so what would it take for you to become wealthy? And in my mind, I said, I had to remove the limitations that were self-imposed. They were put on by me, right? I had to remove those limiting beliefs and think of possibilities. So I said, and he spoke about the difference between passive income and active income. Active income is the money that you have to work to receive. So if you're a real estate agent, you go out, you sell a house, you get paid. If you broke your leg and you couldn't go out to sell real estate, you don't get paid. So that's active, right? Now, if you go out and buy, buy Amazon stock and they pay you a dividend, that's, that's passive. Whether you work or not, you make that money. Profit share is passive, right? Retirement funds are passive. Owning a market center is passive. And I said that that day, one day, one of my goals in my first bowl, now this was when bowl first came out in 2009, right? As a team leader, nobody knew a bowl. It wasn't a bowl coach yet. My goal in that class was to have more, more passive income than active. Now I made the mistake and I didn't put down an amount of money. I just said more. Well, the truth of the matter was that happened in 2018. So when you have more passive income than active income, you no longer have to work. So me going to work, me teaching this class right now, I do it because this is what I love to do. And I would never tell Debbie no to anything. If she asked me to teach whatever, the alphabet backwards and forward in Spanish and in German, I do that too, right? So, so I don't have to do anything. I could stay home and make well into the six figures, guys, for staying home. I choose not to. I still work every day of my life because work is not, work is not a four-letter word in my, in my vocabulary. It's a three-letter word. Here's how I spell work. F U and I have fun every day. I love what I do. And I love the fact that I can impact people the way they process information and influence them. Because if I can become wealthy, you can become wealthy. You just have to change the way you think. Everything you've been taught by your parents, your school teacher and everything else, you may have to let go of all of that, that, that education that you've got through school, through your parents, to accept a new way of life that there's a better way to get what you want. And it's not by working longer hours and harder. That is not true. I don't. I just process information differently. And you can too. And that's possibility thinking. So I appreciate that. Guy. What other questions you guys have? Yep. Jose, you're, you're up. Uh, just going back to like tracking your numbers, which you mentioned earlier, um, what would you say to the argument that that can be like a bad thing? Because if you track your numbers and some people might just like take their foot off the gas pedal, so to speak. Um, whereas let's say you're not tracking it so much, but you're always going like 100%, 110%, um, trying to always do the best you can do, you know? So like, what would you say to that? I can start in this. I could certainly understand and appreciate that. First of all, you can't give more than 100%. There is no such thing as 110. 100% is all you can give. You can give everything you have. So here's what I would do. So are you willing to go through a 60 second coaching conversation with me, Jose, that'll help you change the way you think maybe and maybe benefit you? Yeah. Would you, be, would you be okay? I promise I won't make you look bad. I promise I will make you think differently. Yeah, for sure. Are you okay with that? Okay, so I just want you to follow with the numbers and anybody can help out. So for the sake of numbers, we're going to make them easy to do the math. Is that okay? Yes. So let's assume an average commission is $5,000. I know it's more. We're just going to make the math easy. And let's say for those people who track their numbers, if they know that one out of every hundred conversations they have leads to a commission, leads to a sale. So you know, because you track your numbers, you track, yesterday I had 15 conversations, tomorrow I had 26, the day, whatever. So you figure out at the end of three months, you've had 1,500 conversations and you had 15 closings. So you know one out of every 100 conversations is a commission. Are you with me so far? Yeah. This is not a trick question, Jose. 
What does one commission equal? One commission is 5,000. 5,000, beautiful. Now, if you had one sale out of 100, how many rejections did you have? You had 99 rejections. 99. If one sale equals $5,000, how much does one rejection equal? Zero. Or oh, actually. 99 into 5,000 goes 51 times. Now, if you thought about every rejection was earning you $51, would you step up to the plate and get rejected more often? Yes. See, the human brain we've taught is rejection doesn't feel good because you're not making any money. And I disagree. Because if you know your numbers, every rejection in that example is earning you $51. Go out and get rejected as often as you can. Because the more rejections you get, the more money you make. So never ever think about rejection. Remember this, rejection is a necessary stepping stone on the pathway to success. Rejection is a necessary stepping stone on the pathway to success. The same thing is true with taxes, guys. Don't ever go through life saying, I don't wanna pay my taxes. I love paying taxes. I can't wait to double my taxes. I wanna triple, here's why. My goal is to pay a million dollars a year in taxes because if I'm paying a million dollars a year in taxes, I'm making five. If I'm paying $5 million a year in taxes, I'm making $20 million. Now, if you tell yourself you don't like taxes, your brain hears this and here's how a person processes it. As you, as you start to build momentum and get into achievement phase of your business, your brain kicks in and says, wait a minute, Jose doesn't like taxes. Richard doesn't like taxes. Let me slow down and self-sabotage his business so he makes less money so I can help him pay less taxes. We self-sabotage our own businesses unconsciously. So never say to people or to yourself, you don't like to, you love paying taxes because the people who love paying taxes make the most amount of money. It's a mindset thing. Ask Alan Maycumber in the background, he'll tell you. What's up, Alan? So does that help you, Jose? Uh, yeah. What? I want you to think differently about rejection. I want you to think uh, differently about taxes. Okay. Who else has a question? I appreciate you speaking up, Jose. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. I just wanted another perspective coming from like another way of thinking. But yeah. Thanks. There you go. I'm hoping you got it. Who else has it? I can't see everybody. Not everybody's on the same screen. So just speak up if you need to, if you want to have a question. I have a quick question. Yeah. yeah, so uh, I just joined the Waterford office, and I'm wondering okay. what would you say the best way to find a mentor would be? Go, go to your team leader and your MCA, so Lyra and, and uh, Brandon, and, and find out wh what's available. I don't know what programs are available in Waterford Lakes. So it's been two years since I was the general manager there, so I'm not sure what programs are installed, what they have right now. So I would speak to leadership. Right. Never be afraid to ask questions, guys. Never be afraid. I ask more questions when I'm in front of Gary Keller or whoever, you know, Keller Williams International and I flying to Austin, Texas. I'm the guy, the pain in the butt that asks every question nobody else wants to ask. Here's why. I want to know. Because when I get that information, I can share it with other people and help other people grow and help myself grow because I'm going to pour into myself first. Airplane method. Put the mask on first. Right? So always ask questions. I love that you just did that. Because, you know, sometimes, sometimes people, if you don't know an instructor or a person that's speaking or facilitate, it's a little embarrassing. You, you don't want to, you know, you want to make sure you ask the right question. There, every question is the right question. There's no such thing as a wrong question, Chase. So I appreciate that. Thank you for taking the step to the plate and taking the swing. Who else has questions? So let's go into ahas if nobody has questions. So well, you know, just three or four people, five people. What was one thing? I gave you like 38 things that mega agents think. What was something you wrote down that you're going to take away that said, I never thought of it? Hey, Rich. Yes. What's up, Ken? Hey. Um, I guess today I really wrote down value proposition mm -hmm. only because I think we just always need to go back to that. Um, when somebody, when you're in front of somebody that needs to hire you, or 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 in any situation, um, you know, why are you the best person for the job? And mm -hmm. I've found that is really refocusing on that to a certain extent has really made a difference this year 
Um, also, going back to the Ziegler thing, you know, if you help people get what they want, you'll get what you want. Absolutely. Absolutely. Put other people first. Come from contribution. So, yeah. And again, it's not only knowing your value proposition, it's being able to articulate. You have to be able to express it, explain it. So, love that, Ken. What else? So, Karina said, never settle for good when great is still available. Yeah, my menu's only got great and fantastic. I don't have good on my menu. So when people ask you how you're doing, your aunt, I don't care if you feel like, oh my God, I feel terrible today. I've got the flu, whatever. Your answer is great or fantastic because the more you say good, that's what your brain hears. And then you know what? Your brain just finds good things for you instead of great things. If you want great things to happen in your life, never settle for good. You are great, each and every one of you. I love that, Karina. So uh, Jacqueline said the factors of success, mindset and leverage, yeah. It's not, it's not time and effort. It's mindset and leverage. That's a big one. How you think will process, guys, because that goes back to, think about this. Everything we think, everything we feel, everything we know, if we put it like water in a bucket, what shape will the water take? The shape of what? The bucket. The bucket. The bucket. So everything you know, think, feel, our perspective takes the shape of our life. So if you're processing information, I'll just give an example. If you said, you know, um, expired listings are challenging, if that's what you believe, then that's going to be your life. It takes the shape of your life, just like what it does to a bucket. So how important is what you think? Because there are agents out there that live, make a living, they make a million dollars a year just on expired listings. They love the fact that most people, 95%, don't want to call expired listings. Why? So they could. That's how they make a living. You've got to change the way we process information. Right? And then that, that way you, that new perspective will take shape in the way you live your life, just like the water shapes to the bucket. So I love that. So Denise said, growth happens when you're uncomfortable. Yes, Denise, right? There's nothing, if you're doing things that make you feel comfortable, uh, you're not growing, right? You just think of it this way, people go to a comfort zone to die. If you're in a comfort zone, you're dying, only you don't know it, right? Every day a tree grows, the day it stops growing, what does it start doing? Dying. So if you're not growing, you're dying. And growth equals, it's like going to the gym. If you do a workout and you take 10 pounds and, and you bench press 10 pounds, one rep, and you say, that's it, my, my, my day is done. I don't think you've got a workout. That's a comfort zone, right? You're more likely to drop it and hit yourself in the head and kill yourself. If you're going to work out, work out. Growth is going to make you feel stressed. Growth is going to make you do things that don't feel natural. Growth is going to make you feel things that are uncomfortable, so when you're doing things that make you feel comfortable, here's something, that I'll just give you a thing. That's where people go to die is my point. So uh, when it comes to like birthdays or anniversaries, stuff like that, I don't buy Debbie flowers and I'm not gonna buy her nice things. I don't, I don't need a birthday or an anniversary to tell her I love you. Here's what I do need. I, de I need the day to end in D-A-Y. So if it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday or Sunday, those are the days I bring home things that are unexpected, they're unnatural, she doesn't expect them, they're appreciated. Because on Mother's Day, everybody expects roses. How about a week before Mother's Day? How, why not bring home your loved one and treat them special because it's Monday? You don't need a reason. It's unnatural, it's uncomfortable, and yet that's how you grow. That's how your relationship will grow. If you keep doing it, because if you know the anniversaries, birthdays, blah, 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 then they expect it on those days and the rest of the year, there's no emotion, there's no feelings. You don't say, I love you those rest of those days. That relationship is headed for failure. Mm -hmm. Now, guys, I know that you, you're bringing home flowers to your loved ones because it's Monday, because it's Thursday, not because it's Mother's Day or birthdays, right? Just to change, I just, I think differently. And now, I wasn't born this way, guys. Remember, leaders aren't born, leaders are developed. I developed over time this way. So Spencer said, abundance thinking versus scarcity mindset. 
Revenue versus expenses, opportunity versus limitations, thinking in the future versus staying in the past. I love that. Yeah. And that's all the way wealthy or successful people or mega agents think, right? There's just, it's no wrong. Debbie said, uh, his wife is Debbie for your information. Yeah. So in case there's any, my wife's name is Debbie Carpentieri, not Debbie Irons. Just in case there's any confusion. I mean, I love flowers, Rich, but I want to make sure all these new people that don't know your wife is named <laughs> Debbie too. <laughs> my wife's name is Debbie. <laughs> Uh, so Spencer also said time and effort are not deciding factors of success. Yep, it's mindset and leverage. Uh, Debbie Irons said your biggest co competitor is your potential. Absolutely. Uh, Elena Sanchez, done is better than perfect. Love that. Guys, I don't care if we get things wrong. Your leadership team's here to help you. Doing something and getting it wrong. You know, I, I can go back. I, I don't want to make this about me. But I remember my first year in real estate. And you know, when you're, when you're brand new, you go through real estate school, everybody stays in touch. Everybody takes your name and email. And three months later, you call. And six months later, eight months later. Well, we were probably about six months uh, from graduation of real estate class. And everybody was getting together for a uh, happy hour, let's say. And everybody goes there and they say, well, how's your broker? How's your broker? What is your commission? What is your And all that nonsense, you know, small talk. And people, one person says, well, I haven't sold a house yet. I've sold six. Who sold two? And by six months, I probably closed about 45 units. I had 70 closings my first year, 16 million my first year. I want to say I had about 45 units halfway through 2015. By the end of 2015, I was already hurting because of the Great Recession. Um, and so people, so one person says 45, that's not possible. So what do you mean it's not possible? He says, it's, you, you're only licensed six months. I said, because you didn't do 45, that means nobody can do 45 units. They said, well, that's not possible. It is possible. I, quite frankly, I don't care if you believe it or not. I got paid 45 times for 45 closings. And the point I'm making to you guys is, uh, out of those 45 closings, I bet you I made 35 mistakes. Because I was buying refrigerators, washers, dryers. I was putting, um, um, you know, they had custom comforters that match the blinds and they weren't supposed to be, they didn't convey or they were supposed to convey. I, was, I screwed up every deal I touched. Forget about perfection. On a scale of one to 10, I was like a four. I was, I was screwing up every single deal I touched, but guess what? I was going to the bank, baby. I was getting paid. And here's what I did. I made it right. Every time I made a mistake, you mess up, you fess up. If I took your listing and, and, and I wasn't supposed to uh, convey the refrigerator, I bought a brand new refrigerator for the seller. I, tell, I call him up and apologize, guys. Say, I'm so sorry, David. Uh, I know you told me that the refrigerator wasn't was supposed to convey. They did write it in the contract uh, and I missed it. That's my fault, it's not yours. So right away, David, the customer would be upset. Then I said, listen, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make it right which means whatever you, you I, I'm, I'm not an attorney and you're obligated to leave it now that you sign the contract. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy the same make and model refrigerator, brand new out of a box. And wherever you move into, you get the brand new one, you leave the used one behind. Now, when people, they felt guilty because this was coming out of my commission, they would say, I can't do that. That's no, no I'm not asking you. That's how I'm going to learn. I'm telling you, I'm going to do that. Right. And I would do this. And because I was a person of high integrity, they started sending me referrals. So my question to you is who is better off? The guy who had six units in six months and did them all perfect or me who had 45 closings and did none of them perfect. You understand perfection is overrated. It's not about being perfect. People expect us to make mistakes. Just make the mistake right. Do the right thing. Any other questions or any other ahas? Deb, do you have anything else you want me to wrap up before we leave? Nope, I think that's it. Um, I think, wow, I know all of us probably took a ton of notes, so I can't wait to talk about that. I think somehow I've missed six, so if anybody else mixed uh, miss some we probably need to combine notes and see what we've missed but thank you so much as always rich i know so many of us here you've had such a huge influence on all of us and we could tell rich stories um, all day long so i just want to thank you very much for your time and of course your leadership and changing so many lives just on this and i only hope that 
I can myself honor and many of our ALC members can honor you in, in pushing that forward to everybody else here. So thank you so much. Well, listen, I'm in awe of your leadership, Debbie, and, and the team. My heart, regardless where I'm at, you know that my heart is always and always will be Lake Nona. Uh, that was my first exposure to Keller Williams. Uh, you know, and I was with the, that ownership. I'm still with you, and I still own part of the Market Center. Uh, however, I was with the leadership team for between team leader and general manager for nine years. So my heart is embedded right there. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Absolutely, guys. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank Take you. care. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. And go out and be great today. You're special, right? You're special. Go out and be great. Live great lives. I appreciate you.